Hello, everyone. Welcome to Palladium Magazine's Digital Salon with Michael O'Sullivan. I'm Wolf Tyvey, editor in chief of Palladium. I'm joined by Ash Milton, our managing editor. Hey, everybody. So, our guest today is Michael O'Sullivan. Mike is the author of The Leveling What's Next After Globalization. Uh, he's a member of the World Economic Forum's Council on the New Economy, a Forbes contributor, a speaker at the 2020 TED Talk conference. Um, he's also former chief investment officer at the International Wealth Management Division of Credit Suisse, where he worked for 12 years and he was a lead contributor to Credit Suisse's think tank, the CS Research Institute. So Mike, welcome to the salon. Uh, thanks guys and uh, congratulations on, on your project on the magazine and the uh, podcast. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Um, so we're joined by our live audience of Palladium members. This conversation will be recorded and released on YouTube and as a podcast. To become a Palladium member and get invited to upcoming salons, please visit us at palladiummag.com slash subscribe. The plan is for Ash, Mike, and myself to have a discussion for about 45 minutes and then move to questions with the live audience. <clears throat> Excuse me. Be sure to use the Q&A function in Zoom to post your questions and upvote other people's questions. Um, okay, I'll start with, with my first question. Um, so Mike, your major premise is that the world is going through a paradigm breakdown right now. In particular, globalization is giving way to some kind of multipolarity and institutions have become system, systemically unresponsive. I think that sort of summarizes kind of overall what's going on in a lot of different areas. So how do you see this situation? How did we get into it? What went wrong with the current paradigm that got us to this point? How, just what's your analysis of, of, of this kind of breakdown? Okay. So we, we've been very lucky um, in the last 30, 40 years, we've had a period of, of near unparalleled prosperity. Billions of people have risen out of poverty. Wealth has increased. We've had relatively mm -hmm. few wars. We've had new technologies. Um, and the only time we've seen this really in recent history has been sort of the period 1870 to 1912. Um, <laughs> and what, what, what effectively is, is happening is that globalization is uh, running out of steam on one hand in the sense that productivity in economies is, uh, is falling. Economies are becoming more financialized. We need more debt or, or central bank help to keep going. Yeah. And also globalization is running into the limits of its own success. So again, indebtedness is now um, close to the highs we've seen in the Napoleonic Wars. We have climate change is very prevalent. If you look at what's happening in, in California, even our average temperatures there, well, well above um, long-term averages. And I think also um, a current issue is that it's quite evident now that governments have not uh, spread the bounty of globalization. So there are some countries like my own Ireland or Netherlands where governments uh, spread the benefits of globalization through social welfare systems and higher taxes. Uh, in the States, that's not been the case. A lot of the benefits of globalization have gone to industry and Wall Street. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why you have a lot of disaffection. Um, you know, if you look at the, the ratio between the, the S&P index and the average wage in the States, that ratio is, is at, at an all time extreme. Um, so that, 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 that's, that explains why you have discontents. And also I think just a lot of the, the apparatus of the 20th century is no longer fit for purpose, you know, a bit like sort of right. old cars. They're, they're nice to look at, but they don't go very fast. And that's why we're having these disputes about the, the World Trade Organization, um, the World Bank, World Health, Health Organization, UN, etc., is that they really need to be scrubbed up or, or shut down, and we need new institutions for the, uh, for the 21st century. Right. And, and the final thing is that, you know, it's also not, we're just, we're just at the end of globalization. So it's not quite clear what's coming next. I can tell you what I think is coming next, but to most people, it's not clear. And that right. produces confusion. Yeah, so we're sort of in this moment of uncertainty. I'd like to drill down into some of those uh, issues you brought up, especially sort of the stagnation of uh, real economic productivity and the inequality issues. So let's start with the economic productivity. Um, what do you think is going on there? Like, why has productivity been slowing down? And, and sort of like, 
uh, is that caused by the financialization or does, or does it cause the financialization? Mm -hmm. What's your model of um, what's actually going on with the underlying factors that, that has kind of um, created this, that, that particular situation? Yeah, so, I mean, if you look at some, in, in general for advanced economies, G7 economies, uh, whose populations are stable, uh, productivity is really the only way you're going to achieve proper trend growth in, in your right. economy. Uh, and there's some G7 economies like the, the UK where productivity has dropped to almost multi-century lows. And there are lots of things uh, at work there. So there's the hollowing out and the kind of the simplification of the labor market, and the people leaving companies and setting themselves up as kind of contractors. Um, you have in many countries a failure to invest in education, in training, in, in, in proper R&D. So people are, uh, their skill level is not, uh, not improving. Um, I, I think there's lots of other related things. So there's, you know, I think in the States, a lot of the bounty of investment has been going to a small group of people. Uh, and that has not en encouraged broad investment in, in productivity across com companies and across the whole, um, the whole economy. And I, I kind of compare less productive old economies to, it's a bit like when, a, when an, ath an athlete gets older uh, and they lose their speed, you know, some of them turn to drugs. And in this case, the drugs are taking on more debt or being susceptible to QE from from central banks, so, so I think. So, so let me let me just try to summarize here. It, it sounds like there's kind of underlying some kind of institutional stagnation or something that's that's uh, neglecting some key factors, and then that's leading to kind of this this situation where the easier way to make a lot of money is is to sort of play the inequality game, kind of like just, just concentrate more, more wealth in, in fewer hands. And then that kind of uh, economy is not actually investing in, uh, in real growth. Is it something along yeah, those lines? And, and I think there's been kind of a generalized uh, failure to invest in human capital. Right. Um, and you can see that in things like education attainment rates, even even healthcare scores as well, which are which are somewhat related. Um, so one of the really big challenges ahead, you know, when we get beyond the kind of the COVID shock, is for co countries and governments to begin to discuss what what makes productivity and how how do we get it back. Mm -hmm. And so uh then the. I, I wonder if there's more we can say just on the, the inequality issue before we, it sounds like Ash wants yep. to say yes. something. Yes, uh, yeah, it'll be also be on an inequality issue, okay, great. but go, go ahead, we'll, um, oh, okay. um, I'll jump in. Yeah, I'm just, I'm, just, I'm just curious kind of like digging in more to what you think is, is causing uh, that inequality. I mean, certainly it seems to be uh, a big feature of the system right now is I think sort of since the 70s, we haven't had most of the big growth uh, that we've seen in, in economic sense actually going to a lot of people, like most people in developed countries actually haven't mm -hmm. been seeing that growth. It's been sort of concentrated in a smaller set. Um, and, and then of course, abroad, there are many people have been pulled out of poverty. Um, and, then if, and then that leads to this kind of political unrest, of course, but, but I'm curious um, and just general loss of faith in, in the current paradigm, I guess. Yeah. But um, I'm curious kind of where, like, you know, I, I gave kind of the simplistic model of, well, it's just institutional breakdown. It's become easier to kind of concentrate wealth. But I, I wonder if there's something more, more nuanced we can say about exactly why uh, that happened or that's happening. Yeah. So, so, I mean, I, I, I would say there are, there's sort of three, very, very broadly speaking, three forms of inequality. Um, one that's quite easy to measure is income inequality. Yeah. Uh, and that's always been high in the US compared to other countries. It is now egregiously high in the States compared to the average for the, for the US. Um, and if you look at the, the average salary of the CEO in the States, I think it's something, uh, the average total compensation of the CEO in the States to the average worker, it's, it's, it's like a factor of hundreds. Yeah. Um, 
And I've even gone back to Roman times and looked at the difference between the kind of the meager salary of a of a servant and, and a senator. And, and the U.S. today is is a is a is a number of times greater than that. Um, the income inequality is incredible split, achievement. And, you know, it, it touches on on the current debate. I mean, the the income, the tax, the effective tax rate for for very high earners actually is quite low. Right. So there's, there's no redistribution. So then the second form of, of inequality is uh, structural. So inequalities in things like education, healthcare, that, that, that effectively uh, hit people often as soon as they're born, um, you know, depending where they're born, what hospital they're born into, et cetera. And, that, and then they very often, they carry these inequalities with them through, through their lives. And then thirdly, there is wealth inequality, which is generally quite hard to measure. Uh, there's a guy called Tony Sharks who used to work um, in the London School of Economics, who's got the, the best uh, data set on, on wealth inequality. And he, he shows that wealth inequality, which is kind of all of the household's assets, less their debt um, in the States and in countries like Russia is the most stretched that it's been. And this comes from various sources, you know, it comes from people being compensated in, in sort of uh, in, in equities and, and owning pieces of a company. Um, it comes from QE, from the, the central bank. So a, a lot of households in, in America and Europe didn't have a, a lot of access to, to capital when QE begun because they just come out of a, a deep recession. But anyone who had access to capital who could throw it into the stock market or the bond market did very, very well because largely because of QE. Um, so, so there's lots of things uh, at work here. Um, I want to dig into the wealth versus income inequality thing a little bit, because I think that's something that gets overlooked a lot. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, on the individual or the family level, you know, yeah. it, it's things like, um, you know, a lot of people under 30, it's hard to see how they'll ever be able to acquire a house or land yeah. uh, the way their parents might have. But the consequences of that on a social level seem like they would be important. And I'd be interested in he like hearing what you think the consequences specifically of wealth inequality are. So for example, I would imagine that in a society where most people literally do not have assets to hand down to future generations, we would expect to see people thinking about the future less. Uh, like, do you think this is true? Do you see other fallout here because of wealth inequality? Um... Yeah, so, so I think it's a question of, I, I think you're right to say that wealth and quality is not, it's not yet in the debate because people don't have yet have good data on it. They can kind of see it and feel it, but don't yet have good, good data. So th there are some countries who care about this, right? So unfortunately for me, the two countries I live in, France and Switzerland, both have a wealth tax. So, you know, the end of the year, you kind of, you sum up whatever assets you have and they, they take you know, it's less than 1% in, in tax. Um, and Switzerland is a very wealthy country, but it does redistribute wealth. And I, I think, you know, you guys are a little bit younger than me. So I think your generation is going to go through a whole debate on intergenerational transfer of, of wealth. Um, right. So, you know, richer kids or kids whose parents are wealthier will be lobbying for changes in inheritance taxes um, so that their parents can pass their capital on to them. Mm -hmm. Kids who are, who are less well off will actually be arguing the opposite. They'll say, well, put, put inheritance taxes up to 80% so that the, the rich kids don't get their parents' wealth and, and the rest of it is redistributed mm -hmm. to, to us. Um, so that, that tax debate is going to be a really intense one as we move through the demographic uh, cycles. The other issue then is, is uh, I think, central banks and asset prices, because you know, generally speaking, equities and bonds are, are trading at, at very expensive levels. So if you want to start to build a pension, you know, you're unless we get a kind of a collapse in markets, you are entering these markets at a reasonably high level, which means that future expected returns are going to be quite modest. Mm -hmm. Like, to what extent do you think it's important for wealth? to be something that permeates society in the sense that, um, you know, if you look at the post-war settlement in America, or if we look at like the German uh, Mittelstand type systems today, a big part of it seems to be that a lot of people in society are owners of various kinds, right? Mm -hmm. 
um, or, or enterprises are like small and medium sized. To what degree do you think that um, that was an important part of the liberal democratic settlements? Do you think that you can have a future liberal democratic settlement without, you know, kind of expanding ownership throughout society in this way? Yeah, very good question. So I, I think the key is you want to have broad society, let's say 70, 80% of society, you want to have them be able to expect that they will, will get wealthier in the future and that they can increase their wealth. And that's always, I think that's until the last maybe 10 or 15 years, that's always been the case in America, some parts of Europe as well. Um, and that's been the, the integral part of the whole dream. Uh, and I think what's happened and why we're beginning to get, you know, extreme political volatility is if you look at um, real income growth, so inflation adjusted uh, wage and salary growth in Italy, the UK, the US, th those three countries stand out because in the last 10 years for a big chunk of the population, I mean, it's as big as 80% of the population in Italy, they have not had any real uh, income growth in the last 10 or 15 years. Uh, and when that happens, that, 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 that changes your expectations. And you, you begin to think, well, you know, I, I'm not going to get any wealthier. The system is against me, so I will vote to break the system. And I, I think without colouring too broad a brush, I think that's also what's happened with Brexit and what's happened in the States. There's a large chunk of people who... Just say, look, you know, I can have two or three jobs, but the idea of the dream of getting wealthier is is just not working for me, and, and we need to kind of to break the system, and then they vote for someone who is a kind of a, a human wrecking ball of the political system. Mm. Well, and you know, one of the things we discuss a lot in the salon and in the magazine, as you know, is this idea of you know there was an American-led, some kind of liberal world order. Um, things like the social welfare state or things like uh, ownership and work for the broad mass of society seem to be parts of it. Mm. You and your book focus on an earlier movement, right? The, the, the leveler movement in England, yeah, yeah. which was also trying to uh, expand opportunities for more or less like the broad base of society uh, is how they saw themselves. Do you think that any future settlement can um, think of itself as like a new iteration of what's come before? Or do you expect to see just like, are those old paradigms completely outmoded? You know, this question of reform versus something completely new. Yeah, okay. So I, I think anyone looking to reform a system or build a new system, I, I think you've got to read lots of history because, you know, a lot of it has happened before and it, it may have happened and, and become derailed. So at least you learn from other people's mistakes and the, the group I've chosen to write a chapter about the levelers were interesting because they were the first uh, group in, in, in the Western world, it was then Western Europe or Europe, who, who, who really sat down and tried to conceive what a constitutional democracy might look like and a kind of an equal constitutional democracy. And they wrote it down in, in very kind of concise form. Uh, and I like that example because you see so many movements today who are they're not coherent and they're not, not going forward. They don't get beyond the street protest, etc. cetera. Um, now the group I, I wrote about the levers ultimately failed because they were outmaneuvered and there's a, there's a lesson there. So mm. I, I think anyone taking this on, I think has got to be quite pragmatic, more pragmatic than, than idealistic. Um, and I, I think has also got to consider uh, not overthrowing the system but uh, maybe just taking it on and changing it in a kind of a, um, maybe a less radical way than they would wish. So the, the other extreme is in France, Emmanuel Macron uh, kind of came from nowhere in that he was a very young politician uh, and took over the system, but he took it over from the inside. And I, I think it's quite a nice idea because, you know, the, the French political system is a very, very robust one. And, and it's, it's, uh, it would take more than a little revolution to topple it. And he understood that. So he, he kind of took it over. He co-opted the establishment uh, and has now kind of refreshed the, the system from the inside. Yeah, well, this seems to be the key thing. Like, I mean, 
all the kind of obvious analyses of, of what's going on seem to suggest something like a new social contract, a new kind of uh, distribution of, of wealth and, and opportunity and so on. And a lot of that, you know, especially involves kind of like cutting more people into the deal who had been cut out. Mm -hmm. Uh, and even just as like an investment to kind of like get society working again uh, to, to restart growth. But a lot of these things kind of involve, um, first of all, they require a lot of power uh, to actually pull off any of these changes. It does have to be kind of with the consent of the political elite um, and, and, and the general elite. It has to be something that they're in on and that's that's kind of seems to be the challenge. Like you're you're wanting to reform the system in a way that's that's in some sense like actually redistributing a lot of privileges away from the elite, mm -hmm. um, uh, or or like putting a, a a new kind of discipline on the elite or something, right? Or or having them hold off on on personal consumption for for the good of the whole or something. But but this this requires them to kind of see value in that or or like a total defeat. And I think a total defeat, like you say, isn't going to happen. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, like how to actually work with the established elites to to sort of propose the new model seems like a a, a very difficult uh, proposition. Yeah. Uh, and know, I point out that in the Leveller case, right, they were the context of the English Civil War, the killing of the king, right? Society being disrupted in these yeah. unimaginable ways at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, you know, th there's this question of whether it's easier sometimes to just build new institutions rather than reform them. Um, the lever, the leveler settlement to us now seems moderate and familiar, but yeah. at the time they're they're proposing yeah. quite radical differences. Right. Yeah, I mean, I think we probably need you know new institutions, new settlement, and so on. But I think obviously it's going to involve a lot of the same elites, right? It's like a yeah. lot of the same people have power. It's very difficult to go up against established power. Um, and, and it's not, not really a good idea. It's not, it's not necessary even, but there's this difficulty of actually getting the people who are sort of currently cut into the deal to realize that there's something wrong and realize that it's in the long run, not even the best thing for them. Yeah. Um, and I'd be curious to hear kind of like what you think would be the logic from the perspective of the people who seem to increasingly think that they can just hold on to their own power, um, you know, in some ways at the expense of, of the whole. Like, I think a lot of people are expecting to kind of get away with it. Um, yeah. Or maybe yeah. they're not seeing it that way. They're, they're just seeing the, the thing kind of working still for them. But I'd be curious to hear what you think will change that consciousness uh, among okay. the elite in particular. Well, that's, it's, a, it's a big area. So, you know, in, in small countries, let's say Ireland and Switzerland, there is a lot to be said for uh, the physical proximity of the elite to the people, mm -hmm. because you, you know you 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 kind of a uh, if you have to live if you if you're wealthy and you're part of the elite but you, you kind of live amongst the people then you you can you see what's happening in society and and if there's unrest it will affect you. I think in the U.S. a lot of very wealthy people can cloister themselves away from the reality of what's going on. Yeah, there's a lot of class segregation in the United States. There's a lot of class segregation, exactly. So you head off to the Hamptons or whatever you do. Um, so that, that, certainly doesn't, um, that certainly doesn't help. I, I think one, one, one factor for me, uh, and this is a slightly risky proposition, um, is that uh, th this constant kind of um, policy of QE from the central banks has lathered over a lot of economic problems. And it's obviously it's contributed, I think, to wealth inequality. Um, and it's probably forestalled a, a reckoning of some of these some of these issues. And, and I think if you didn't right. have me there, a lot of these issues from the incompleteness of the Eurozone to um, maybe lack of decent investment in parts of infrastructure in the US may have been tackled earlier. So I think that's one 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 big factor for, for me. Um, and I think if I was a politician in the States, uh, the kind of vision I would, um, I think you could paint two visions. One is of a kind of, you know, society in peril and we need the capital of the wealthy to, to rebuild it. Or 
what all, what politicians have often done is 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 point to a bigger enemy, and you you know you kind of construct a, a narrative that China is overtaking the U.S. and we need to mm -hmm. to retrain every everyone etc. and we need to kind of raise taxes to do that. Um, and that's the kind of thing politically that might work. Um, otherwise, then you you know you probably default to kind of more more radical. Uh, left-wing policies of kind of tax the rich, which, as you say, is uh, becomes very contested and very, very, very uh, yeah. destructive. Yeah, or, or the real the real rich end up not getting taxed. It's a bunch of like yeah. petty rich. That right, right. But the way you phrase the question, Michael, I, I want to ask a little something about the the way you see the world order going. From 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 your wording, it sounds like you reject the notion that there is a necessary conflict as powers like China start to rise in the world. I, I'm interested if that's accurate. Um, and, and if so, you talk about the leveling on a geopolitical level as being mm -hmm. this more multipolar world. Um, yeah. What is the, you know, what level of conflict do you expect here? Okay, so, so that, that's where we're going. So if you, there's a very good uh, macroeconomics database um, constructed by someone called Angus Madison, who sadly is dead now, but he, he, he constructed a database of GDP going back to the year zero for a whole bunch of countries. And if you graph that, you will see that for a long, long period of history, the biggest economy in the world was China and then India after that. So internalized in, in Chinese society and history is the sense that China was number one and now they want to get back to be number one. And you know, Xi Jinping in, I think it was 2012, he started talking about the China dream well before Trump had make America great again. So that, that, that's, that's kind of China's sense of, of direction. And, and I think we're coming now from a period of you know, heavy globalization, which was led by America. Globalization is fading. And I think we will eventually arrive at a situation where the world is multipolar. So you have three big regions, Europe, the States, and China, um, who are not only sizable, but also do things increasingly distinctly so their, their value different values begun to come to come out so the best example i can find is the internet now the internet used to be global so google had about 30 percent of the chinese market share uh now it's got zero and these regions increasingly look at the internet in very different ways so right. america values tech innovation and the financial rewards you know the internet companies are, are stock market monsters China looks at the internet from a very political point of view and has cordoned it off. Uh, and it, has, it also has this massive e-commerce uh, economy as well. And then Europe um, takes a very data and privacy centric view of the internet and is effectively becoming the regulator of the internet. Right, so we um, have regional forms of digital sovereignty now to varying extents. Value, uh, yeah, I would say value driven uh, approaches to internet sovereignty. So each of these regions will increasingly stress its own values and priorities. And then you've got, you know, other countries, kind of medium-sized countries, Russia, the UK, who are a bit lost. Um, you've got big populous countries like Nigeria, who I think have got promise but need to decide what their path is, what models they follow, etc. But do you reject, um, kind of just to restate, you, you do mention, I think, the Thucydides trap idea, for example, right? Yeah. And this idea that there is an inevitable conflict uh, as a rising power meets an established power. Um, like, do you expect, uh, you've talked a lot about like economic strife, for example, that you see mm. coming up, but what about the, the hard power side of that question? Do you think yeah. that there will be war? Do you think that there will be, some like proxy conflict, things of this sort, or, or will there actually be some kind of stable ground uh, met in the end? Yeah, so I, I think more, the world we're going to will be a world of absolutely more friction. Mm. Um, and when I say that the instinct then is to, is to automatically think of kind of great battleships firing at, at each other in the South China Sea. But I, I think what we will have is, is conflict rather than war and they're they're very different things because right. conflict is permanent tension and agitation but it's across many different fields mm -hmm. um economic financial um and we're already there so you know if you look at what russia is doing russia is an expert in conflict um 
you know, it's, it's not officially at war with anyone, but it's doing lots of things from trying to corrupt politicians, to poison people, to the little green men, just to agitate at the West. Ch China is doing the same. So China has never been uh, in a greater state of agitation with its neighbors. It's, it's having disputes with Australia, Vietnam and Philippines over, over, over fishing. Uh, you've had the confrontations with India. Um, uh, Hong Kong has been subsumed to my, you know, to my horror um, uh, and effectively uh, silenced. Um, so, so this is this is already started, and um, we. It's very clever because you know it's not outright war, and it's done in ways that are softer than outright war. So we, in the West, don't don't immediately contest them. Um, uh, so I, I, I think that that's that that's kind of sinister in that sense. So there, there is a great contest beginning to emerge, um, and we see it, you know, rippling through you know Eastern Europe and other other parts. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I guess I guess in a nuclear multipolar age, you don't really want to get into a real war, um, and so you get lots of this kind of uh, conflict going into these other domains, like you say, this this agitation, intelligence stuff. Uh, yeah, economics, politics, ideology, and so on. Yeah, I I want to ask you a little bit about Europe's role in this, Mike. Um, so you've placed the European Union uh, specifically as one of the poles in this kind of multipolar order. Um, when I look at Western Europe, right, there do seem to be attempts to create this third force vision. So you know, M Macron has talked about humanist values, for example, or the mm. humanist tradition. Um, but it, you know, the, the conflict in Western Europe seems to go on. China, meanwhile, is making itself felt in uh, some of the Eastern states. Russia's presence, obviously, is, is still in Ukraine and now Belarus. So it seems like Europe as a continent, there, there's this kind of chessboard going on. Multiple powers are making themselves felt in Europe. Given that, though, how, how do you think that Europe can actually end up reclaiming sovereignty from this or uh, is it fated to kind of stay a chessboard of sorts? Yeah, so I, I, I think viewed from afar, Europe always looks messy and chaotic because of the complexity of Europe. Um, and you look at Europe's history, you know, we, we've been at this longer than anyone else and it's been the bloodiest part of, of the planet for, for almost forever. Um, my, my own view is that Europe is steadily, you think things in Europe move slowly but surely or they, in the European Union. And my own view is that Europe has slowly been getting stronger. So I'll give you a few examples. So if you compare the founding of the dollar, um, you know, with Alexander Hamilton running around with, with the militia, the whiskey rebellion, etc. The, the early years of the dollar were even more chaotic than the early years of the euro. The euro is settling down now. And I think one of the things that has happened through COVID is that many people, I think in, in the UK and elsewhere thought, ah, we have a crisis, Europe is going to fall apart. And actually, broadly speaking, Europe has emerged stronger. Uh, economically, it will be stronger. The, the EU can now issue debt and can, can, um, uh, it can tax. Um, and there's a degree of kind of cohesion now across the leaders. Brexit as well has shown I mean, Europe has dom totally dominated the UK during Brexit. It's been totally united. And I say this from the point of view of Ireland, which has uh, really be, been, been served tremendously by, by Europe. And Europe, I think, in, in its trade policy and other areas has been very, very strong. It's not as coherent or strong in, in its foreign policy. And I mean, I, I think it's been... been um, very lackluster in the response, for example, to what's happening in, in Belarus. Um, and you still have different countries with slightly different policies um, on, on Russia. And, you know, just to provoke the American audience a bit, I mean, I, I, I found that during the COVID crisis, America has actually looked more like Europe because individual states have been doing totally different things. And the governors of individual states have never, to my memory, been as prominent. So they're a bit like the prime ministers of European countries. Um, and I thought, I thought that was interesting, like, you know, what COVID true, did. It's sort of uh, a federalism of like regional rivalries yeah, kind of happening it, it, in the US. It, it, yeah. Exactly, exactly. 
Um, so the challenge for Europe is, I think Europe's got a huge technical challenge in just continuing to build out the euro. It's now moving from a union that's, that was based on geography. So basically during the period of globalization, Europe expanded eastwards, it took on 13 countries in the east. And now it's changing to a, Euro, a union based on values, respect for democracy, the rule of law, respect for women, LGBT community, etc. cetera. Uh, and there are countries in the East, uh, Hungary and Poland in particular, uh, I would throw Cyprus in there as well, where there's a lot of Russian money, who are, who are beh consistently behaving against European values. And what we will see now is a kind of a contest where Brussels would begin to say, look, we're, we're not going to give you financial aid anymore if you do this. Um, and that's happening. It's, it's, there's actually a big debate going on at the moment about this. Um, so that, that kind of is where, where Europe is going. And that's consistent with this multipolar world because it, it's a world where Europe is, is slowly trying to define its own values and what it means and what it means you know, what are the shared values between a German and an Italian? So to say Europe in this case, do we mean Brussels? Or is it something broader than this? Um, when I say Europe and Brussels, that's the equivalent of saying Washington to America. Right? Sure, so sure. But what I mean is that, um, you know, in, in the American project, we've seen that the kind of regional locus of power, let's say, behind it has kind of yeah. been known to shift, right? I, I, I guess true, my yeah. question here is, do you think that Europe will remain the project of Brussels, France, and Germany, or do you think that it actually ends up expanding uh, and, you know, that there is a kind of real loyalty and uh, in-group even, you know, sense among some of these other countries that right now are at loggerheads with Brussels? Um, I think Europe is, is probably too big, and I think the general sentiment is not to expand, but to stop and take stock and to clarify European values. Now, mm -hmm. what is interesting is that the, 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 the relative power between the countries is slowly beginning to change. Um, so Germany was always the, the big economic driver. France is cut off a bit. And what's going to happen now is that Merkel will, will retire. And it's not clear who will take over from her. And whoever takes over will not be as forceful and respected as she was. And you have a, a period, I think, of fragmentation in German politics. And German, Germany was never very prominent in foreign affairs anyway. So that, that leaves foreign policy in Europe almost open to um, the French. Mm -hmm. And um, speak, you know, bring the French in here. Um, one of the things that I have found interesting coming out of France is this um, I don't know if you want to call it a call, but the proposal, let's say, of, of Macron and others for some kind of European military agreement. Um, mm. the, you know, we, we've discussed kind of economic uh, and diplomatic vectors of, of Europe here. I agree, arguably, that the, you know, Europe has made itself felt the most there. But, you know, in terms of European peace, for example, there is the thesis that the European Union settlement has somehow driven this. There's the counter thesis that actually, no, it's the American military umbrella the the weakness of a lot of European militaries vis-a-vis -vis the United States uh, mm -hmm. and maybe a couple of the largest countries, not including Germany, obviously, is actually the system, right? This is why Europe is at peace. Um, I, I'd like to hear what you think the role of the military umbrella is there. And, you know, in order to be, like, does the proposal of a European military indicate that there's more seriousness here? Uh, like, are they rejecting the notion that American power should be the source of kind of European peace? Okay. So, so I think, first of all, there's, there's no, you know, Europe, most European countries do not feel militarily threatened. You know, there's no sense of kind of tanks are going to come across the fields tomorrow. Um, and I, I, I take the point, I mean, some of the European armies like Germany, their combat readiness is very, very poor. One in six helicopters and tanks actually is combat ready. Mm. Um, I think the idea for a European army, and also there's, there are new proposals for like a European FBI and things like that, that, that is all part of the trend towards making Europe more self, more, more together and more self-sufficient. 
Um, as re and I think most European countries are, are ready for it. I, I think also in the big European capitals, there is total dismay, total dismay at the President Trump's proposal to, to, to start to exit German, I mean, he's actually transferring troops in Germany to Poland, but there is total dismay at his attitude to NATO. Um, and I, I think these calls for European army are, are in my view, a sense of uh, Europe, Europe beginning to throw in the towel on, on America and American right. foreign policy credibility. And I think even if Joe Biden is reelected, I mean, his team are very pro-European, the, the few, you know, a number of them are fluent in a number of European languages. It will take a long time to, to, to build back that credibility. Um, yeah, so, I, I mean, this is, if, if Europe is kind of like going to be charting its own path as an independent power, that does involve, you know, some of the things that the other powers that are actually kind of chasing sovereignty have had to deal with, right? Like they need their nukes, they need their tanks, uh, they need they need like a, a coherent deep state that that actually wants sovereignty. They need to start thinking very seriously about where their values come from, because like all, all the stuff that you mentioned of European values. I mean, that's stuff that kind of was imported from America in the 20th century. And, and Europe is still actively importing value discourse from the United States. Um, and, and, and so like all these things are kind of like elements of, uh, you know, dependency on the United States. And, and so I'd be like, it seems like for there's a long way to go between kind of where Europe is and an actually independent, serious Europe that like, you know, they may not be feeling threatened, but a lot of that is because uh, you know, the United States is currently occupying Europe. It's an effective uh, American power rather than. Right. And, 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 totally and back, backing, backing Europe. And if America actually did pull out, like, you know, like uh, Trump wants to or or as, as some American, some future American uh, administration might want to, like it, the immediate question is like, well, what about Russia and Turkey, for example? Like, why don't mm. they just kind of roll in and start taking territory? Or what about China? China is actually making a lot of moves into Europe. Yeah. Um, so, so this question of like, how will Europe actually develop the level of seriousness it needs to, to hold its own, not just in this kind of like, uh you know within the kind of globalization paradigm where yeah. where everyone's like a friendly uh, liberal democracy but in in like a more real uh game where where there's actually real conflict and tension between great powers um yeah. it, it it seems like they, there's a long way to go for them um and and a lot of the stuff they seem to be focusing on doesn't uh doesn't actually lend strength in those areas yeah so i mean you know, American democracy is founded on Thomas Paine, French thinkers, French revolutionaries helping the Americans against the British. So uh, the, they, the, the two continents are, are, are interlinked. Um, of course. I, I, don't, I don't, the way, the way you've described the relationship, I, I, I don't think that would ring true with most European leaders for a number of reasons. Um, I, I don't think that they feel Europe is Mil is threatened militarily. I think they are beginning to wake up to this idea of kind of conflict and constant right. tension. Um, so Russia is the obvious ex example there. In, in some areas like cyber, some European companies are quite well advanced in intelligence. They're very well advanced. Right. I, I don't think they feel a need to go and fight big wars in, in places like Iraq or Afghanistan either. No, of course. Um, and on, on, on areas like trade, Europe is quite strong. Now, I think there is a big gap in foreign policy in speaking with one voice. Um, right. So, you know, Belarus uh, is, is a clear example of that. What's happening um, with Armenia at the moment is another example. So I, I think if I had to make a list of areas where Europe needs to become more coherent, I think having a clear foreign policy, uh, a credible foreign policy that kind of goes above the member states is, is, is one area. Um, I think Eastern Europe is, is an area that needs an awful lot of work in terms of, you know, basically forcing the likes of Hungary and Poland and Cyprus to say, 
you know, you have to choose. You're with us, or you're with Russia, uh, or China. Um, so, so, so Act kind of, as a poll, kind of. Yeah, I, 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 exactly. Um, and, and I think, you know, with the election on the way, most European diplomats are hoping for uh, a Biden re-election, uh, Biden um, to be elected, so that Europe and America can come together as kind of partners. So you have two thirds of the multipolar powers, you know, back together, you know, broad, broadly kind of shared common values and working on common projects. And if you go back to the start of the Trump presidency, I mean, he could actually have struck up a kind of a trade deal with Europe against China um, and cho chose not to do it. So we do have uh, a number of questions coming to the Q&A. Um, yeah. So please keep those coming to the audience. I do though want to ask you one more thing before we get to those moving uh, away from the Europe topic for this last one. In the book, you predict a new global recession by 2024. Um, I, I, I don't know if you had meant that it will occur by 2024, if we will have gone through on by 2024. Yeah. Um, but you sort of name the high debt of China and of corporate America. So on both sides here, as a cause of this recession, you even speculate, uh, which I found quite interesting, that institutions like the IMF and WTO could cease to exist maybe uh, mm -hmm. as a result of these events. So it's been, uh, I think now, correct me if I'm wrong, about a year or two since you were writing the book. I'd like to hear, um, you know, now that we're a little closer to time, now that we've had the pandemic as the setting, is this still your prediction? Uh, have you upgraded? And, you know, if, if, if this is still what you're seeing, um, maybe you can tell us what has affirmed your yeah. uh, thoughts here about the future. So, so the pandemic, uh, I didn't forecast the pandemic, even though someone wrote to me and said that I did mention something about a pandemic in, on, on some page, but I, I, I truly did not, did not forecast. Uh, you, you should own that, put it on the, the jacket. Of the uh, exactly, exactly. So it, it was a very, very big shock. And, and I have to say that the speed with which it has been dealt with, uh, generally speaking, was impressive. So, so my thesis was that, um, you know, if you look at all the drivers of the world economy, trade was slowing, productivity was slowing, um, the world was taking on more debt to compensate from this. Um, and you know, you've rarely, if you go back in the last, I think, 5,000 years, you rarely had a situation where you've had as much debt relative to GDP um, and not had a major dislocation. Um, so I, I still think that that, that is um, likely because what we've had now, we've had, I think the, the result of, the, of COVID is that you've had certain sectors that have been destroyed uh, other sectors will be severely impaired. So you're beginning to see in cities in America and Europe, commercial property really suffering because you know, no one's going to work, etc. Uh, you've got some at the same time very exciting things happening in healthcare. Uh, there's a greater premium for new technologies, etc. But the the backdrop of growing indebtedness is, is even greater. And in very, very simplistic terms, this acts as a kind of a handbrake on economic activity because companies or governments who have a lot of debt, even though rates are low, they still have to pay that off. And at some point, they begin to get called on that debt. Um, so one, one of the big, for example, one of the big Chinese property companies, Evergrande, is they have $126 billion in debt um, and you're beginning to get kind of jitters in their indebtedness now. And, you know, if, if we have a kind of a credit event um, where credit spreads begin to rise, that, that could be quite damaging. And, and also, I think we just, uh, the world or, or the developed world needs to go through a kind of a, almost a cathartic kind of debt crisis or something just to get rid of all this debt, be it restructured or whatever else. I mean, I have... In the book, I, I talk about a, a world debt conference. Um, and part of the reason I talk about that is it rhymes with history. In 1924, um, there was a, a world debt conference where Britain and France forgave Germany its debt. And then they went to America and said, will you forgive us our debt? And, and you may get something quite similar this time that um, you need to have kind of debt restructuring amongst nations and, and companies.
Yeah. And I just want to say you also propose in the book um, a kind of international treaty between central banks as part of this, right? Where um, yeah. in future, things like QE are done under very defined conditions. So I'll, I'll throw that out for the audience. Um, you know, perhaps someone will want to follow yeah. up on that idea. Um, do you think, though, you know, it, during the pandemic fallout, if we compare to 2008, say, we saw a lot of countries, uh, including to a very small degree, the US, look more at direct transfers of cash, of support yeah. to citizens. Um, you know, various places have described uh, some kind of assistance to small businesses and the like. Um, to what degree do you think that that will become institutionalized uh, as a way to deal with economic crisis of this type? Like, are yeah. people now used to the idea that in a moment of crisis, actually, if I don't have a job, there should be money appearing in my account if it's a big enough, you know, crisis. Yeah, so very, very good thing. question. So, yeah, we, we, you know, America, even America briefly went kind of socialistic. Um, so I, I think it, it has, it's been a lesson in speed, the speed of policymaking, the speed of the response. And it's crystallized a lot of ideas that are on the left and the right. So, you know, one, one idea is kind of basic universal income, uh, which was floating around. And now I think people have got a, f a sense or a flavor that that actually could be implemented. Um, on the other hand, what is also coming down the line potentially is our digital currencies from central banks and the idea of um, where, where central banks become even more powerful and that, that in a digital currency world, each of us would have a bank account with the ECB or the Fed. And if they wanted to stimulate the economy, they may just say, right, we're gonna give some money to all the families with two kids. And you know, press a button, it's in the account tomorrow morning. Um, so we, we are probably going down the line towards uh, a greater connect between the state and the people. And that's double-edged because the closer you get to the state, the more the state knows about how much you earn, where your wealth is. Yeah, and it you become can, legible in a radical way. The state can reach in and, and say, oh, you know, we, we've had a crisis. We need to raise taxes and we're taking the money out. So it, it's, it's a really double edged sword. And technologically, you know, I, I'm not sure is, will blockchain be the solution, but technologically, we will be closer to this as well. Wolf, uh, I'm thinking we should probably go to Q&A. Um, yeah, that sounds you want to good. Take the first one. Yeah, that, great. Um, so I Matt, see the question there on, on little green men. So little green men, just to explain, were was the phrase that uh, people gave to before Russia kind of almost officially invaded Crimea, uh, kind of undercover Russian soldiers mm -hmm. uh, snuck into Ukraine. They were called the, the little green men, kind of unofficial. Yeah, uh, yeah. they're Russian soldiers without official uh, insignias yeah. or anything identifying yeah. them as such. Um, yeah, so Matt Ellison asks, um, is how we measure inflation, which is to say with market baskets that exclude key assets, hiding the true inflationary effect that QE is having across the Western world? To what extent does this aggravate wealth inequality or how does that happen? Okay, good, good, good question. So the best way I have of explaining that, Matt, is and I, I uh, have a chart somewhere, I can't show it to you now, but if you look, if you can graph the price of lumber, lumber futures, right. and the price of Tesla, since March, it's almost the same chart, okay? And that's interesting because, you know, lumber, which is obviously used for, for making houses in the States in particular, has doubled or trebled in value. And the discourse around that is, ah, there's gonna be a recovery, house prices are going up, et cetera. But I think the real explanation for that, for that is that lumber has become one of many speculative assets right. um, under the, the kind of the steam of QE. And, and Tesla is the same. I mean, you can, we, can, we can probably have a debate about how profitable Tesla is, but Tesla is a, a speculative asset. So I, I think a lot of the inflation, you know, there's been in the last 10 years in most countries, there's been very, very little CPI or headline inflation. There has been huge 
inflation in financial markets. So that tells you that the liquidity is going into financial markets, not into the real economy. Right. Um, and that policymakers need to do something else to, to change that or to divert that. So I, I think you're right to question whether we're looking at the, the right basket of inflation. I would take it further and say it, it's just in the wrong place altogether. Yeah, so I, I, this kind of brings up an interesting thought that I've had in the past, which is there seems to be kind of two, two types of inflation. One is asset inflation, where people are trying to store wealth. And if the government is printing money or otherwise kind of adding to the money supply, um, anything that's kind of dollar denominated isn't going to be going up, whereas speculative assets, you know, lumber, stocks, uh, mm. gold, Bitcoin, whatever, uh, those things become sort of safer places to, to, to sit your wealth. And so as the government prints money, you actually get uh, an inflationary effect on the prices of those speculative goods. Yep. Um, but then that's very separate from uh, sort of like the active circulating money supply that inflates the price of um, you know, wages and, yep. and food and, and things we actually have to purchase on a day-to-day -day basis. And, and so that's like, um, those things seem quite separate to me. And I, I'm just curious, like what has kept down the, um, I guess, circulating money supply and the, and the yeah. or, or the price of goods? Like, why has the price of goods stayed stable? And is that, like I've, one story I've heard is that it's, you know, cheap stuff imported from China, keeps the basket of goods low priced, and that actually masks um, even uh, price inflation. Yeah, so I mean, so, so there, there's been a whole range of things. I mean, for me, it goes back to what we discussed earlier, uh, wage growth. With the exception of the last two years in the States, wage growth has been very low. So people don't have the wherewithal or the willingness to pay pay more for, for what, what they buy. Right. Um, you, you, you've had the globalization effect for sure. The cost of, of of imports has been low and steady. You've had a smaller than expected effect from the internet, from the so-called Amazon um, uh, Amazon effect. Mm -hmm. um, and generally, I mean, in the States, the retail sector is highly competitive as well, um, highly platform-based. Um, so that, that tends to keep the, the, the price of goods um, lower as well. Um, and again, I think, you know, you, you, you really only want inflation to rise if wages are going to rise as well, because otherwise you, you, you get, you get um, stagflation, you get kind of negative real wage growth, right. even or worse off. What is your read on China moving forward? You mentioned Chinese debt being a problem. Um, and, you know, when I've looked at the way that even things like funding seems to operate in China, there that you yeah. see these weird patterns where in an IPO, you know, you, you have these artificially low prices where uh, people, party members, elites, well connected people can sometimes buy a part yeah. of the company and then the market is allowed to take over. Yeah. Um, what do the next 10, 15, 20 years look like for them, in your opinion? Yeah. So, uh, you know, China is fascinating. And, and I think in the West, we're probably not well informed enough on China. Um, part of the reason for that is a lot of the, the really interesting stuff goes on behind closed doors or, or, or we and, and the Chinese people are shielded right. from. So it's hard to get information in China. It's very, very hard. And, and so, you know, the Communist Party in China is, it's like Democratic or Republican Party. It's full of its own factions and arguments and intrigues and you know, assassination attempts, all, all sorts of stuff. Um, and, and there is kind of legendary levels of, of, of um, corruption within the kind of industrial political right. scene in China as well. Just we, we're, we're less aware of it. Um, so so my, my view on China is, you know, what, what, what it has done is, is truly remarkable economically. And I, I think it begins to run into a few headwinds. Uh, debt is one indebtedness is one. They're being very, they're, they're actually being quite tough because any companies, real estate companies who have a lot of debt who are going bust, they're not bailing them out. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, that's, I think that's a, it's, it's a tough but healthy message to, to other players. Um, I think the biggest risk to China is, is a period of high unemployment. Unemployment there is very low at the moment. 
because you, you have this kind of bargain between the people and the government where the people are kind of happy to un undergo complete surveillance of their phones and, and their movements in return for prosperity and national prestige. But as soon as that kind of, as things like job security breaks down, uh, then this becomes tested. And, and China is no different from Europe or the States at the moment in that it's kind of, it's suffering economically. Um, so I, I don't think that China can grow at 6% per year for the next few years. I think it's going to have to go through a period of very low to negative growth and how it deals with that in terms of keeping social stability would be the, the really big challenge. Um, yeah, um, it's, it's a weird country in the sense that I, I think people see things like the surveillance state there as a, a sign purely of this, you know, centralized power, uh, a, a country that wants order above everything. And sure, that's kind of true. But I, I think we underestimate the degree to which it's the sign of a party state that actually doesn't know very much about a lot of the country or a lot of what's going on uh, yeah. in, in the economy. We, yeah. we should uh, move forward, though, on the audience questions as well. Um, Stephen asks, what do you think of the thesis of stagnation in economic growth and productivity, particularly in the U.S., beginning in the early 1970s, well before problems with globalization became visible? So just context-wise, one of the topics we've discussed in these salons is this idea that, like, everything seemed to go wrong in 1973 or thereabouts, right? The, you have these political crises, stagflation, um, you know, after 1973, the embryonic forms of yeah. the financialized economy start do you think that there's some kind of flip that happens in the 70s? Um, if, you know, if so, what is it? And if not, do you, do you see it elsewhere? Okay, God, uh, that's, a, it's a, that's a long, uh, potentially long. So, so I, I, I think the, what I would zone in on, I think, is, and, and, and it's very important today because it's under threat, is the whole idea of good institutions and because the 70s um nixon had i forget his name he the head of the fed under nixon was the, he's the only fed chair to have been a treasury secretary as well and he made he made such a uh, arthur burns no uh, miller i think was the guy's name miller uh he was fed fed chair for about a year and a half um George he Miller's. made such, such a mess of it that they promoted him upwards to be treasury secretary kind of get him out, out, out of harm's way <laughs> failing upwards exactly um so it was a period of kind of of of, of policy incompetence uh the fed was not quite independent in the bank of japan at the time was not independent the Bundesbank the same so the really big change i think around then is that you had um uh you know the the uh, obviously the, the fed uh, became independent um, and, and you've begun to kind of crush uh, inflation with higher rates. And then Reagan followed with supply side reforms. So uh, I think the chaos and the, the incompetence of this, you know, even in the 70s, Britain had to apply to the IMF for AIDS. So it was a period when a lot of things unraveled. Um, and I think that unraveling was met with an institutional response, which has helped to drive the prosperity through the 80s, 90s, and 2000s. And my worry now is a lot of those institutions are under threat. The Fed is perceived to be less independent than it was, the same is true for the Bank of Japan, et cetera. Um, so that would be a pity if, and, and you know, there's a, a book just out on Jimmy Baker. Uh, and I'm a fan of James Baker because he stands, for me, he stands for kind of competence in government. Uh, and, and statecraft. And I think a lot of that is going missing now. Uh, Wolf, do you want to take the next one? Sure. Um, so Jonah asks, in your book, you note the importance of human development as a driver for economic growth. So what's the highest leverage policy we could adopt to increase human development in, in countries that are starting to slip on this measure? Okay, so um, in the book, I write a lot about the kind of the small country model, and I'm, I'm obviously biased as an Irishman living in Switzerland, but right. a lot of the countries who kind of crack this are, you know, Finland, Norway, Denmark, etc. And in those countries from an early age, you have very, very good public education. Um, and then for people at, at, say, 15, 16, who don't continue in education, you've got very, very good 
um, kind of reskilling or apprentice kind of programs. Um, so, you know, in the States, and this would be totally radical, I, I would just, you know, invest massively in really, really good uh, public education. I'm not sure it's feasible, mm -hmm. politically acceptable in, in the near future, but that, that, that for me would be the, the top of the list, actually. So, I mean, the education issue in the United States has obviously been a uh, subject of a lot of a debate. Um, I mean, certainly people have tried kind of throwing money at the problem uh, in various ways. The, I think it, it seems to be kind of saddled with uh, a lot of ideological and institutional problems and, and kind of like false expectations as well about, about what the purpose of education is what they're optimizing for and so on like we we don't seem to actually know how to do it in, in the states like how to set up a good school um mm. or what what that would mean or like maybe we do know how to do it but to actually do so runs afoul of a lot of uh ideological presumptions that are are around in, in the discourse in the education system so it seems like you know at least in the united states just throwing money at the problem uh or like kind of investing more in it by any sort of imaginable initiative uh, within the current paradigm would not work. And you need sort mm. of uh, something quite different from how we've been thinking about it um, yeah. that that may be uh, quite controversial because I, 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 this is just sort of my observation that the American education system is, or the American education paradigm has kind of like, it's not delivering progress and people have done a lot of effort trying to fix it within the paradigm and, and, and it doesn't seem to be going anywhere. Yeah, no, I mean, listen, I mean, America's got great schools, great, great universities, you know, leads the- Some of them. <laughs> yeah, yes, some of them, yeah. So they're, you know, the top 10 universities in the world, four European, the rest are American. Um, so it, it's at the, the leading edge, it's just that it's not for everybody. Um, do you accept the like elite overproduction thesis that there's just you know everyone is trying to make it through this particular educational process and 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 to a degree status hierarchy uh whereas there used to just be more tracks right uh, even in the u.s yeah. we still have in other yeah. countries yeah so uh, you know every everyone wants to get their son or daughter into harvard or you know, whatever but so i, I think i think the public ed, the, the school system as well is probably where, where I where I would focus because um, you know what what it's it, in a way it's a kind of philosophical question so in in Europe in most European countries there is there's just people don't think think about kind of not sending their kids to the local school okay um, that state run schools are, are generally you know it's a case in Ireland for example generally very very good and private schools and privatization of education is in some countries is not encouraged at all. Um, so I think that it, it's kind of, it's almost a philosophical thing where, you know, you need to, to where, whatever city you are, part of the States, you need to expect that you can go to the local school uh, and have a good education. Yeah. I mean, again, this kind of comes back to the issue of class segregation in, in the United States. Like, I think part of the reason people are reluctant to send their kids to uh, to the public schools is like, you know, some of them are quite bad just in mm. just in the the kinds of social dysfunction that get yeah. concentrated in those in the schools just because of like yeah. the the classes and the state of the classes uh, of Americans who are going to those particular schools and so people they don't want to associate with with the the kind of like. Yeah. especially dysfunctional lower classes. And, yeah. and so that's kind of what's driving the, um, a lot of the measures of, of like really bad outcomes and, mm -hmm. and people not wanting to participate and so on. And then that, again, it's like, it's very difficult to see how to fix that, like whether an actually better school model would even be able to fix that versus like mm -hmm. whether that's a much larger social problem. Yeah. Um, and this is like, like one sort of way you could push back on the school model is is like, well, what if there were, uh, you know, just like more kind of reasonable manufacturing or trades kind of jobs uh, and, and perhaps more acceptance of those things as legitimate paths for, uh, for let's say middle-class people. 
Yeah. Um, like I think right now, you know, like like Ash was kind of alluding to, there's a lot of class anxiety in the United States of, uh, about what kind of occupations you go into, and then like a lot of these occupations actually aren't that functional or are actually not accessible right now because of uh, various credentialisms and so on. So there's all these surrounding issues uh, that like, you know, even if you could send your kid to a good trade school or something, would they actually have somewhere to end up in society? And, and mm -hmm. if, if you did have somewhere for them to end up in society, how necessary is the schooling versus, versus those surrounding factors that that, yeah. that make the schooling useful, uh, sort of the social context. Yeah. I, I want to just point at like Germany here, um, which I've, I've tweeted about this as well, but I think the reason that their system is quite successful is that the, it, it works closely, especially in the, the trade and technical schools with industry. And so you you have as you're saying wolf the social context economic opportunities for people to go into and then the schools train to prepare people for those specific contexts and so mm -hmm. you know to draw on something that you suggest in the book mike um or a couple things so the um revival bank uh, i think you call it correct me if i'm yeah. wrong there and yeah. the notion of you know taxing income uh, differently depending on various industries um, you know, when you spur the actual opportunities, then you can create the education systems in response to those. And I, I think that that's probably more and more the way that uh, my own mind is going on this. Um, yeah. So may, maybe this is what I, you're I alluding it, to, uh, in part. I think the German system is very good now. That it, it's very, very structured and it's, it's developed over a long time. Um, and one idea I, I'd sort of put forward is you know, as we kind of go to a world where people are more aware of, of values and social values, and, and this has been made utterly clear by the, by the COVID that we, you know, governments having for, spent years cutting back on healthcare services, they then lead the applause for the nurses and doctors, which is a, you know, another irony, um, that we should actually take on the lessons of the COVID crisis and institutionalize them. So you kind of say, well, is it more important to society that we have good doctors or we have good derivative traders and or nurses? Right. Uh, and then, you know, should we, should the doctors and nurses have uh, a tax credit or pay lower taxes or should the derivative trader have a higher tax to reflect the, uh, the social value of their work? Um, now, to my knowledge, no government has tried this yet but it's, it's a potential idea. Um, and I, I can see it catching on in some countries. Um, well. Yeah, and I mean, context wise here, um, uh, again, for the audience, you know, uh, Mike, in your book, you're a big fan of Alexander Hamilton. And I, it's yes. like a big part of Hamiltonian thinking is seeing the economy and the life of the country as a kind of system that you have to steward. Uh, you can't just sort of, leave it and let the weeds grow and so on. The, I think this for me was one of the most interesting parts um, of, of the book. I wanna get to the next question though. Um, Marco brings us back to geopolitics. Uh, he's asking, do you think or predict that middle powers like Turkey, Japan, or Brazil will become more powerful and actively interventionist abroad in the near future? Um, you know, on, He mentions Turkey here, uh, I guess with Azerbaijan and Armenia, it sounds like we're seeing a little bit of this already. Yeah. So I'll take them one by one. So Brazil, more people have been killed in Brazil internally uh, during, than people in the Syrian war, uh, in, in the uprising in Syria, which is astounding. Um, so and Brazil is not a, a geopolitical power. It is a country kind of at odds with, it, with itself. So I, I'm not sure it would be a geopolitical player. Japan is very interesting because Japan could, could, it has the wherewithal to build a nuclear weapons program in about three weeks. I mean, they've got the parts, they just need to send, you know, someone down with a spanner and sort of, they have very good missiles, they've got nuclear technology, etc. Right. Um, and they are, in a, 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 they are in a period of high tension with um, China. So there is a Japanese Air Force website where you can look at the number of Japanese fighter jets that, is, that are being scrambled. And the, the average for the last couple of years is about 400. And this year, I think we're at something like 900 scrambles. So there, there's 
there's just constant incursion from Chinese fighters and then a reaction from the Japanese. So tension levels are very high. And, and I think Japan will become more militarized and more ready. And Japan is one of four countries in a group I find very interesting called the Quad. And it, so the Quad is basically, it's a, a geopolitical alliance of India, Australia, America, and Japan. Um, and it started off as a kind of a gentle kind of club and it's becoming much more strategic and they do more maneuvers together and sell each other um, weapons. And that will be, I think, the bulwark against China in, in Asia. And, you know, if you look, if you listen to the military discourse in Australia, they are becoming very, very worried about China militarily. There have already been a number of spy scandals in Australia involving the Chinese. So all that is hotting up. So that's definitely going to be a, uh, a point of contention. And then there's Turkey. And I, I'm, I'm baffled by Turkey because the Turkish foreign policy used to have the motto of uh, no trouble with neighbors or something like that. And, and now they're, 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 you know, they have conflict with everyone. Pretty much everywhere. They have Syria three, and so on. Sep- there are three separate conflicts where they are against Russia, um, Armenia, Azerbaijan, Syria, and Libya. They have threatened French warships, Greece. So, I, I mean, this will, at some stage, will, will invite, and that they, you know, they're using Russian mil- missile systems and they're a NATO member. So there's so many contradictions. I think this will probably end badly. Um, and it's already, what's quite interesting, is taking its toll on, on Turkish financial market. I mean, the lira is incredibly weak. So I, I, Turkey is a big army, um, uh, but I, I, I just, I, I can't see the coherence of what they're doing. You know, it's, it's a bit like a kind of a, a drunken guy on a Friday night, just lashing out at anyone he can find. Is. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. is there a single strategy that a country that is what we call a middle power should mm-hmm. pursue? Uh, or, or is it just too context dependent to say, and I'd also be interested to hear if you, you know, you see any middle powers that are actually pursuing what you think is a really good strategy that we haven't mentioned yet. Um, so I, I, the, the, the ones who I like are countries that I call micro powers and they are small states who have relative to their size, a lot of geopolitical power. Israel is one, Abu Dhabi, Dubai, the Emirates is another, and they've just signed this, this effective peace deal with Israel. So they're very powerful financially, very powerful in the region. Singapore is another one, Switzerland. Ireland to an extent, um, and if Joe Biden is elected, Ireland will probably be one of the key countries in Europe because he of his connections to the country. So I think the idea of micro powers is something I, I've been writing a bit on. Um, of the middle powers, I mean, uh, the one I think that would be interesting is the UK because it has uh, elements of grandeur, delusions of grandeur. Um, it really is going through a crisis of identity. Um, and the risk for the UK now, I think, is in four or five years' time that Scotland votes for independence. I, I, I personally would be in favour of it, but it, it, if it does, it will diminish the whole idea of kind of Great Britain forever. Mm-hmm. Um, so that, that need, will need to, to, to completely re- reinvent itself. Um, and I kind of think as well, we, we don't talk enough about countries with fast growing populations, Ethiopia is one, and Nigeria is one I've mentioned, that, that can go either way. Um, Bangladesh, Indonesia, you know, some of them are, are either on the verge of an economic boom or they're on the verge of steadfast Islamification. Mm. Um, and they are potentially very, very important countries because they're so big and so populous. Mm-hmm. I'm going to jump in. Uh, we do have a few questions left. So I think what we'll do for the rest of the salon is uh, probably go a little more quickly in between them yeah. and make sure that kind of everyone but, uh, gets theirs in. Wolf, do yeah. you want to take the next? Yeah, let, let me take this next one. Um, so we've got a question from William. He asks, does improving technology stave off the reckoning with elites? Uh, for example, automated manufacturing and force multiplying military technology. So I think the the argument that he's getting at here is that 
um, as as kind of economic production and and military force and uh, you know like I guess internal security of states um, becomes more technology heavy and more capital heavy and uh, it therefore also becomes less democratic um, mm. and 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 so it, this can kind of prolong the ability of of let's say an entrenched elite to uh, to not think about realities beyond beyond uh, its kind of like internal concerns. Um, so I'd be curious to hear uh, if you have an answer to that. Yeah, God, that, that's a complex um, question. I, I read some great books on it. There's one called The Age of Surveillance Capitalism by Roshana Zuboff, which touches a bit on this. Um, I, I think one of the issues you know, we've just had, I think today or yesterday, we've just had the IPO of Palantir, right. which is a AI tech surveillance company, very much the preserve of the, the elite in terms of its ownership. Um, so I think that's one of the issues that the elite own the technology, uh, much more so in China and the US than in, than in Europe, where we don't really have, I mean, Europe doesn't really have a tech sector. That's one area we, we've right. just not, uh, we, we failed to, to, to grow. Um, so I, I think I think I generally agree with the, with the, with the question. Yeah. Um, and, and I find it at the same time, I find it hard to see how you might have a popular backlash against um, technology. I, I don't think we're, we're there yet at all, actually. Um, I mean, I, that's sort of the uh, kind of the take I would have on this more and more is we see automation talked about a lot. Um, sometimes it works. Uh, in a lot of cases, it seems like there are human components that are overlooked or there are failures that aren't being highlighted. I wonder to what degree the talk of automation is kind of like um, a sort of hype strategy on the part of uh, business and so on mm. to point to a source of reinvigoration before it's really you know, evident that it actually exists. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I once, a few years ago, I had a, a tour of the, the Ford factory in Dearborn and had a demonstration mm. of one of these big robots. And it was kind of whizzing around in front of me. It was quite a ter terrifying <laughs> demonstration of the power of robots. But um, I, I think, I mean, ob the obvious response to that is that you need, it's, it's another call for more reskilling. So if people are being displaced by technology, then they need to, to reskill and go into other sectors that are maybe more human centric. Um, mm. And I think the way the US labor market is structured, there will be a big backlash. So if you take the, so the one, the one profession in the States that's got the highest number of occupants are truck drivers, there's 2.3 million truck drivers. And if we had driverless trucks and they were all displaced, you, you know, I think you have political chaos. Um, so we're, I think, I, I don't think we're there yet in terms of, of, of seeing a popular backlash to technology, but it, it, may, it may come. Mm -hmm. um, Stephen has a couple of questions here. I'm going to combine a couple of questions that he has on Europe Matters again. Um, I, it, that sounded like it was quite interesting to the audience. So um, first one, uh, do you think that Macron is actually leading some kind of fundamental reform in France, or does it end up being like a very well-branded reinvigoration of the you know, neoliberal settlement? Okay, so I, as I said, I sp spend my time between here and Paris, mm -hmm. and I've seen, I live in the center of Paris, I've seen terrorist attacks, I've seen Notre Dame burn down, I've seen the strikes, the riots. And I, f I firmly believe that Emmanuel Macron is sincere in what he's doing. I think he's a very honest guy. Um, you may disagree with his vision, and that he's a bit caught up in himself, but I think he, he, is, he is a man with a, with a plan and with a drive. And he has already done reforms in the labor market, entrepreneurship, etc., that are, are meaningful. Um, and I mean, unemployment is beginning to come down quite a bit in France. It's still actually relatively low. Um, and we've been hit by, by COVID. So I, I do think he is, um, and don't, don't, I think what people don't see as well is that there's a, a whole kind of movement of people behind him, young people behind him who are kind of pushing him forward. Um, so I think that that has got energy. 
and he is he is the source of kind of energy on policy in Europe as well. My 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 only worry is he's he's just one person. There's not a lot of other people like him. Right. So again, maybe uh, if if he steps down, there might not be a successor. Well, if he steps down, uh, or or I think... you know, not steps down necessarily, but at at some point. You know, presumably you'll need more than the one, the one man. Yeah, he he may he may face a rival in his former prime minister Edouard Philippe, who is a very capable guy, um, and I think would be a very serious politician as well. Um, so we 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 will see, we will see. But I think, I mean, I I, I think France is actually um, not very fashionable to say this, but France is is actually not in a bad place at the moment. You know. Mm. Uh, I'm going to move us to Stephen's next question. So this one is addressing some of the stuff we discussed earlier. Yeah. Um, Stephen uh, asks, so you, you mentioned that European countries, by and large, do not feel militarily threatened. Uh, if that's the case, then why are they totally dismayed by the proposal to remove U.S. troops, which is, I think, uh, an, another point you had made earlier? Yeah. Um, you know, how, how do these get reconciled? Um, yes. Yeah, so so uh, I, I think that the, they're dismayed in that the threat to remove troops has got so many other things behind it because what they see behind it is the destruction. Um, it's a bit like a divorce. It, it's the destruction of everything that Europe and America have built together in the last 50 years, the institutions, the relationships, etc. And in many European countries, you have American ambassadors who are, Germany is a good example, who are political, political appointees who are really rubbing people up the wrong way. Um, and, you know, e even in Ireland, which is, which is extremely close to America, people are, are just, just un and we've had such a, a, a clear and fixed idea of what American re America represents, people are shaking their heads and they, they, they you know, it's for the first time in, in in decades and centuries, you know, people don't know where America is going. And, and then when they see people in America, uh, uh, you know, questioning institutions, the rule of law, democracy, um, it's baffling and it's worrying. Mm -hmm. um, so to it's to me, the sides the here, sorry, I was, the, the sides almost seem weirdly switched, right? Like on the American side, where it's generally accepted that military power, American, like the military umbrella, um, is yeah. the important part of the alliance. You would expect that they would want the Europeans to kind of stay out of the military arena, let us have the monopoly. On the other hand, for, for kind of people who want to build Europe into a third force, you would think that, you know, the American secession would be an opportunity for something else to fill the vacuum. But in fact, the Americans yeah. are the ones calling for European military development and the Europeans want the Americans in. So it's to me, this is like yeah. a very geopolitically strange equation. It's very strange, and, and you get these strange times when there's a flux or a change. And I think with, with regard to Russia, I, I, I mean, you can speculate as to what, what is going on, but the, uh, the relationship that the White House has with Russia and the president has with Russia is, is, is causes an awful lot of concern. And if I look at the advisors, the foreign policy advisors around Biden, so people like Nick Burns and Tony Blinken, I mean, they have a very strong and clear view on Russia that's completely aligned with London, Berlin, uh, et cetera. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, so, so pe pe people suspect the worst of, of Trump. Um, and I think, yeah, that, that's why there's kind of, you know, just, just general kind of consternation and, and confusion. I mean, it's, it's, I have to say to your point, it's, it's good for Europe too, because there has been a lot of complacency in Europe on foreign policy and, and people just need to, need to wake up and to, to have been shaken up as well. Mm -hmm. I think we're um, nearly at the point to wrap up. There is one follow-up um, that I did want to ask you um, that we didn't have time for in the first part. So you know, in writing this book, you've given a kind of a very high level theory about the mm -hmm. what's going on in the future of the world. Um, you've drawn a lot, obviously, on your professional experience. I guess I'm, I'm interested to hear, you know, did you, you know, start thinking about these things with a lot of theory already in mind? Or did you develop this very empirically from what you were doing? And like, uh, you know, building on that, 
what is something that like a, a myth or um, an, an overlooked thing in the world that we aren't paying attention to that yeah. your work has let you learn about? Okay, God, that's a good question. So my interest in globalization comes from years ago. I, I wrote a book called Ireland, the global question because Ireland was the most globalized country. And I wrote about that and, I, and, and about the imbalances that were beginning to come and then everything kind of collapsed in, in Ireland, et cetera, and that and the rest is history. So I, I always had an, an interest in, in this particular debate. And, and then my career has mostly been in financial markets so far. And that's a really good testing ground for seeing how all these forces act each other and, we, and whether they matter and, and not and how people are pricing them and what's beginning to evolve. That's been quite a good training ground. Um, and I, you know, I like to write and read and I, I write, a, I mean, that's eight years, I write a, a blog called the, the Leveling Blog, if anyone wants the, uh, sorry, the Leveling, yeah, Leveling Blog, sorry. Um, yeah, we can link you know, it in the, in the description. We can, yeah. So I do, I write that and I send out every Sunday morning because it's the, the one time people have a chance to read something. So partly through that, I've, I've managed to test out ideas as well. And I've traveled a lot as well. So I've, you know, I've, the last couple of years, I've been, you know, one week Israel, the next week Saudi. Uh, and you can see a lot of these changes happening on the ground. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, before Khashoggi, the week before Khashoggi was killed in Turkey, I was in Saudi and I came back and someone asked me, what's going on. I, I actually give a very positive kind of view that Saudi society, which I'd seen evolve, was changing for the positive. You know, women, just even the, the, the change in what women wear. Um, and then of course the Khashoggi thing happened and, and it changed everyone's view. But so I've seen a lot of these things play out as well per personally. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. for, firsthand is always the best. Yeah, it is. Uh, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. And then to, you're, I mean, you're, you're, yeah, what, what are we missing when the obvious one is climate change? We're not reacting to climate change. Um, and go back to the levelers. I think anyone who wants to change or reform, I think you need to have a kind of a simple manifesto and a plan to do it in a very practical way that uses what system is there already. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is there a crisis that we are not looking at? Like, um, I, I, I mean, something that if, even, you know, we, we are ignorant of, uh, you know, climate change, yeah. our action is bad, we kind of know about it. Is there anything that we've just missed altogether? Or, or like, do we actually have a pretty clear map of what we need to do? Um, is th that's a bloody good question. Um, no, I think we have enough to worry about. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, uh, Wolf, right. I'll hand it to yeah, you to wrap that's, up. Yeah, so this has been a, a great salon. Um, we're just about out of time. So Mike, that was uh, that was a lot of fun. Thanks so much for yeah, joining us. Likewise, thank you very discussion. much, guys, and for everyone on, on the call. Yeah, yeah. Great. Yeah, so Mike's book is The Leveling, What's Next After Globalization, if anyone wants to check it out. Uh, special thanks, obviously, to all our Palladium members and the audience for the great questions and the support. To become a member, get, get invited to upcoming salons, please visit us at palladiummag.com slash subscribe. And remember to subscribe to Palladium Mag on YouTube and follow us on Twitter at Palladium Mag. Um, so with that, thanks everyone. We'll see you next time. All right, thanks everyone. Yeah, okay, thanks guys, bye. Okay, and we're done with the recording.